As a kid, I didn't know what a bullet was. And this is how it was described to me for the very first time. It's that motorcycle with a big headlamp, big tank, and when it goes by, you hear this doof, 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 doof sound. I wasn't very sure. So I was told it's the motorcycle that you see all the police wallas on. Still not very sure. So then I was told it's the motorcycle that the dude wala comes on with the cans on the side. Ah, I got that. And that was a long time back when the bullet was a bullet first and Royal Enfield second. But like I said, all of that was a very long time back. And so much has changed. New needs have created a new Royal Enfield and a new legion of customers. Nowadays, Royal Enfields are seen ferrying laptops and gym bags on weekdays. And in weekends, they play the starring role in Facebook posts. Royal Enfield and their motorcycles are no longer rustic tools. They are urban cool. In 2013, Royal Enfield is a brand to be reckoned with. Known as much for its lifestyle image as for its motorcycles. And if you walk into a Royal Enfield showroom today, You'll find it packed with variants of the classic motorcycle and of course the Thunderbird. And of course, a queue of customers waiting to get one. So, in this kind of scenario, do you think that there's still space for this Royal Enfield's old school Bullet 500? But I think that the Bullet 500 can make a really strong case for itself. Here's why. Firstly, the Bullet 500's motor is actually low-tech. It's gone back to a carburetor. And that is fantastic news for traditional bullet fans who want something to tinker around with and will spend Sunday mornings getting their hands dirty. This is absolutely golden for them. The lack of electronic and electrical interference makes the carburetor a preferred system to be stuck with when the chips are down, say, in the middle of a desert. Secondly, the way the engine and carburetor are set up you get peak power and torque early in the rev range. So you learn to shift up early, ride that slug of torque, sit back and relax. The mighty 499cc single cylinder four stroke motors, 26.1 bhp of power is pumped out at 5,100 RPM, while the peak torque of 4 kg is developed at 3,800 RPM. In our roll-on acceleration tests, you can see that the Bullet 500 is only a few tenths of a second slower than the Classic 500, which is very impressive. And the benefit of its easy-going nature is apparent in the fuel efficiency. The Bullet 500 returns 32.6 km per litre to the Classics 28.9. Now I can't believe I'm about to say this, but this motorcycle actually feels quite smooth. I mean the clutch feels almost buttery, the gear shifts are precise, and the engine as long as you don't rev it too hard, turns over quite happily. Now, from the saddle, this motorcycle is really quite pleasant to steer. I mean, the seating position is nice, the handlebar has a nice rise to it, so easy to reach out, very comfortable, relaxing in that sense. And that aside, it is very nice to steer too in terms of agility. Despite its weight and size, you could maneuver this through city traffic or sit out on the highway and just cruise along. The Bullet 500 comes with grippy MRF rubber with a 19-inch front rim and an 18-inch rear. The Bullet 500 is also a shade heavier than the Classic 500. Not that it hampers the ride experience in any way. So is this very different looking from other Royal Enfields? No, but somehow it is different, isn't it? I think the centerpiece for me is the emblem on the tank reminds you of those old bullets and well for the old vintage feel of course there's also the amp meter here to show you the condition of the battery you have the flared and step seat and uh, oh the mirrors let me not forget the mirrors round mirrors very easy to adjust 
really cool. Modern touch, a foam backrest for the pillion. Some of the styling cues, like the seat and bigger fenders, are responsible for the couple of extra kilos that the Bullet 500 carries. Despite that, it is going rather well for this motorcycle. So, what's missing? Well, I'm sure the spec sheet ninjas will be quick to point out that some of the power and torque has gone missing along with that fuel injection system. And sure, if you wind the revs up, you'll find that a little bit of punch is missing. But low down in the rev range, the torque based on offer, I don't think that's lacking. And by no means is this a slow motorcycle. So compared to the classic 500, the straight line performance is slower. From 0 to 60, the gap is very narrow. But as the revs climb, you can see the Bullet 500 falling behind. To the 100 km h mark, the fuel injected classic is faster by almost 2 seconds. And when it comes to cruising, the Bullet 500 is happiest between the 80 to 90 km h zone. And like most Royal Enfields, the ride quality is great over lighter imperfections or slightly broken roads. But when you hit a big bump, some really rough stuff, it will toss you around. And the fled seat for the rider could do with better cushioning for longer rides. And the one thing that really needs to get fixed is that front disc brake. The feel at the levers is just so wooden. Okay, there is one last gripe. Even though the Bullet 500 felt smoother and better put together than any previous Royal Enfield we've ridden, we still had a few issues. The bike silencer and the EGR hose did come loose. Clearly, there is still some way to go. So the Bullet 500 has its shortcomings. But its simplicity and laid-back air give it enough appeal to coax you to look past those shortcomings. Sometimes less is more. And in the Bullet's case, that's exactly how it is. You know, I really had fun piloting this motorcycle around. This handlebar with a slight rise to it, it gives you a nice seating position, very upright and comfy. Uh, that aside, it turns in also surprisingly quickly. It feels agile for a motorcycle that's, well, 193 kilos. BMW kicked off the high-stakes bid for electric vehicle supremacy in lavish style this week with the unveiling of the i3 hatchback at simultaneous events in New York, Beijing and London. Well, we are here in London at the world premiere of the BMW i3. Now, the i3 isn't just another new BMW. It's what the company calls is a revolution and the beginning of a new chapter for the company. Now, the i3, BMW's first all-electric vehicle, is what the company says promises to be the future of mobility. It comes with a raft of new technologies, a revolutionary new design. So let's see what it's all about. Conceived under the working title Mega City Vehicle, the i3 represents a number of firsts for BMW which spent an estimated 2 billion euros in research, development, testing and production processes for the new four-seater. Innovations include a lightweight carbon fiber body that weighs just 1.2 tons despite housing a battery that weighs 230 kilos. The strength of this new structure allowed BMW to do away with conventional B-pillars and instead fit rear-hinged, coach-style doors at the back of the 5-door hatch. The i3's cabin retains a lot of the contemporary styling cues seen on the i3 concept with a clean, easy-to-use layout and four manually adjustable seats. We have been uh, developing a specific design language uh, for BMW i. That is a little different from the normal BMW because the purpose of this car is different. 
uh, of course you recognize a bit BMW into the kidneys, into the precision of the surfacing, but we have the possibility with a BMW i to also create this very specific identity for BMW i, for example a very uh, clean shape language, uh, very strong contrast uh, also that makes the whole overall appearance uh, very strong. We have a black belt or black elements which are dividing uh, the proportion in a wise manner and that also helps to show uh, the values uh, or the efficiency of the car, for example, lightweight and aerodynamics. The i3 rides on a bespoke aluminium chassis with a McPherson strut front and five-link rear suspension. As with its more traditional BMW siblings, the electric hatch has rear-wheel drive and a 50-50 weight distribution. These are key elements which promise an authentic BMW driving experience. The first production BMW to rely on electric propulsion, the i3 is driven by a synchronous electric motor mounted above the rear axle. The e-drive motor provides 168 bhp and 25.4 kgm of torque, driving the rear wheels through a single ratio gearbox, offering the choice of three driving modes, Comfort, Eco Pro and Eco Pro Plus. Juice is fed to the motor from a 22 kilowatt lithium ion battery and the combination gives the i3 a claimed 0 to 100 kph time of 7.2 seconds and an overall range in comfort mode of 190 kilometers. Recharging the battery to 80% will take half an hour plugged into a high power 50 kilowatt socket or up to 8 hours on normal domestic power supply. The i3 is destined to be an urban vehicle. The i8, I think, has a much broader appeal. The i8, of course, is a plug-in hybrid. The i8 is a sports car, so very, very uh, emotional design, very dynamic. Um, but I, I think the i brand in total has potential in most markets around the world. It may take longer or shorter, depending on various circumstances. But you know, overall, every urban environment in the world has a number of challenges in terms of CO2, in terms of emissions, and therefore these vehicles are there for the future. So the i3, it's going to be the real first mass-produced BMW electric car. It's going to be the first mass-produced car with carbon fiber technology. Now that's really a big deal for BMW. It's going to cost around 25,000 pounds and that's with around a 5,000 rebate from the government. But the question you're asking is, will it come to India? Well, not quite yet. This concept is a bit too early for the Indian market where we've seen electric cars really don't take off. So the i3, not destined for the Indian market so far, but future i models could make their way here. Stay with us because Hormuz will be sharing the juiciest news from the world of Indian automobiles in school.